So I get interviewed, they ask how the market's doing, I give them my, my opinion, and hopefully people listen to um, If you want, you can follow me on Instagram, at Investment Real Estate AZ. Feel free to take pictures, to take me, to take yourself. I love social media. I have built a considerably large business on social media, but that was another class for another time. Um, my, just a little bit about me, just so that you know, like, why am I even listening to this lady? Um, I am originally from Washington State, so the Seattle area, um, uh, I'm like north of Seattle, like almost Canada, like I spent my 19th birthday in Canada, and you probably know that. Um, I'm a mom of two daughters, so I have an 11, almost 30 year old and an eight, almost 20 year old. And they are literally the reason I do everything. They, you know, I believe very strongly in, um, in girl power and in, in bringing women up in the world and, and what that means in especially uh, industries where women are not always present in there. Um, I have a real housewife junkie. That's just like a random fact about me. I don't want to talk to Bravo franchise. Yeah, that. <laughs> 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 um, my background, uh, my educational background is I went to the University of Washington in Seattle, Go Dogs. I studied business management with a focus in finance because I really like numbers, and so I'm super boring. That's why I don't have to watch Real Housewives. <laughs> um, my corporate background is I worked for Boeing, like every good Seattle person did. Uh, I've also worked for Microsoft and a variety of other small corporate companies. Um, I just ultimately decided that I can't be contained in a cubicle because it just, it's just too outgoing. Um, my real estate background though goes back to our first house we purchased in 2007. Um, and we flipped it while we lived in it, which I would only do as newlyweds because it might break you at any other point in your marriage. Literally blood, sweat, and tears. And then we lost it all in the next transaction because the market fell apart in Seattle. And um, we had, then we started rebuilding. In that process, it made me start thinking about a real estate career because there was so much we didn't know. There was so much that wasn't explained to us. There was so much that I felt patronized over or I didn't feel like I could ask. And so I just pride myself in walking people through these transactions to, so that you understand or not if you don't want to, but that it was up to you and not because that information was held from you. I'm currently, I am with MHG Commercial. I come from like some other multifamily uh, boutique brokerages, but I like the ability to be able to do multiple things and to work with my rad team, and so I sit here now. Um, but I specialize in multifamily and investment properties, income producing properties, so that can mean like house hacking, um, you know, multifamily properties, Airbnbs, anything where people are trying to 
use that type of purchase to make money, essentially. Okay, so why work with us though, right? You heard Aaron and now me, we paid over almost $300,000 in residential partner referrals last year. So if you chatted with Aaron at all and you're like, okay, that sounded really confusing. How do we do that? Just call us. We pride ourselves in being ethical, um, in really taking care of our residential partners. We did 80% of our business last year with residential partners. Because we specialize in kind of those small businesses and not like your big, huge, like Boeing businesses, we need our people when they're like, hey, I just had this buyer move from California and he has a restaurant and now I don't know what to do with him. We'll take care of them. We'll walk you through the process if you want or we'll just take it over and that's all negotiable and, you know, whatever you want to learn. Um, we pride ourselves in ethics. I think our oldest deal was like a three-year-old referral and we finally put her, her client into a property. We had to track down two brokerages that she left to, to pay her her referral because we just take it that seriously. But we found her and we paid her her referral like she totally forgot about it. Uh, and then you can learn through the transaction. We're all willing to teach you. Like I said, it's, it's about what you want to know and how much you want to be involved with it. So then going into that, before we go into multifamily, what would be the dangers of practicing outside of your scope of work? Because I think sometimes we don't talk about that enough and I think people don't think about it. The destruction of your entire financial life. Right, <laughs> pretty much. Because you are, you're, that's not your buyer or seller's fiduciary interest, right? If you are practicing outside of your scope, like some of those lease terms Aaron was talking about, those are like, like did we even know some of those existed? Correct? Um, your E and O insurance, if you get sued, won't cover you. They'll be like, oh, you were doing what? Yeah, you, how many of those have you done? Zero? Mm -hmm. Sorry, not going to cover you now. Which means then you won't get the broker back in either. It's not saying you can't do it. It's just saying you won't get in. Ready? If you're listing something, make us co-listing so we can answer questions. If you're representing a buyer, loop us in so that you can learn and we'll talk about how to split it that way. It's not to say don't, it's just saying pump the brakes a little bit, be cautious, because we don't want you to be in a bad position either. Okay, so now, so where do we find multifamily deals? You probably recognize this from Aaron's slides, they're very, very similar. You can find a lot on the MLS, but they are mostly on LoopNet. If anybody's familiar with commercial LoopNet, there's a lot of multifamily, but like Aaron said, it is the Zillow of commercial. It's like I have stuff that I sold last year on there. Like it's just to bring kind of leads in, so you'll get calls from people and you're like, that's probably been gone for months and months and months. And months. The other one is Crexy, and that's even worse. But they, you know, they generate buyer leads and stuff like that. And they are a good platform. I would just recommend making sure you're looking at new ones all the time, but even then those can still be on. Okay, so what's the difference, right? Multifamily is kind of weird because it rides in both realms of our world. Well, residential, four units and under, commercial, five units and up. But what, but why? Well, in terms of financing, for a residential multifamily purchase, so your quadplex, your triplex, your duplex, that financing looks very, very similar to what you're used to in residential, right? Um, if they live in the property, it can be an FHA, it can be 3% down, VA 0% down, conventional as low as five. Um, but if they don't live in the property, and they already own something else, and they need to put down at least 20% because it's considered to be an investment property. The comps are ran very similar. The, uh, the financing is very similar because it's all just kind of comp based. What did a duplex sell for over there yesterday, right? So there can be some nuances though. Personally, when I'm listing, I always need the appraiser because especially with a fourplex or like a residential property, they're not used to looking at what makes this valuable. Is that parking structure? because that's valuable. People will pay more rent in order to be able to park under you know, an hour of the sun. Does it have storage units? What's the square footage of the bedrooms? How many bedrooms? Does it have one bath or two baths? These are all really big deals that they don't always think of, and so I always try and make sure I meet those so that you know we can talk about 
why I feel like my property is valued as much as it is. Uh, and then commercial is where we start getting different, okay? And that's when you need 20 to 30 percent down. You can't it, you can't reside in it. It doesn't it doesn't matter unless it's sitting on two separate parcels. It, it's always going to fit under that commercial level. Uh, and that's if it is a performing asset. What is a performing asset? Remember those cap rates? Remember the NOI? We'll go over that again in a little bit. But meaning like this is generating money. Not it's going to generate money. It is currently generating money. And that they will then base the appraisal on those leases, on the rents, on what it is currently generating. And if it is not, and we're talking about performa, then you may struggle to get lending on that. Is that when you need 30 percent now? Uh, it could be, or if you have like too many properties, or I mean, there's just a variety of reasons. There's also reserves that can be involved, meaning they want to see a certain amount in the bank account to adjust for for lease property, something along those lines. It just gets much more creative. I have lenders for that, but uh, that's why I'm like, just loop us in. Like, we'll help out. Um, and then the the appraisal is different. They don't look at the five bucks next to it and they're like, what did that sell for? They look at the performance of the property, the cost approach. Uh, so now, does this look familiar? This is what the MLS looks like, right? But if you open it up to look at multifamily property and you're kind of like, I come again, what does this mean? So I'll just go over some of it to look at. This top section, this is like what size units, okay? So efficiency units, those are your studios, then obviously one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom. It would be pretty rare that you'd have like a five bedroom and a five bedroom. Um, so the number of units, their average rent, average square feet, um, and baths, okay? So in this particular one, you can tell that there was one three bedroom and four two bedrooms, right? So that now you can see what the breakdown is so that if, if it was entered correctly, then you shouldn't have to call to find that out. Remember that pre performa? That's where you find out is this a performa property or is this an uh, owner, an owner property, like did the owner prints, owner provided, did the owner provide these numbers, meaning actuals, or did they not? Nine times out of 10 right now in Arizona, I'm gonna tell you it's gonna look like that. And then the rest is gonna be a mess. So they can see, speaking of the cute real, the vacancy allowance, what does that mean? And this is all going to be important for the NOI. Vacancy allowance means how long does it take or how much dollars does it take to refill that, that property, right? So you'll have in a performa, some people will say zero. I never have to refill this property. Well, but somebody might have to someday and it's gonna cost them money. So they need to calculate it into their NOI. Typically in multifamily, we just use five as just kind of like our default number, 5%. This is all important. Really important. In fact, this is one of my first questions I call. Pardon? It might help to clarify for people 5% oh. of what? 5% of uh, gross rents. We'll go over that in a minute. So, this is really important what the tenant pays and what the owner pays because, again, that's going to go into your MOI. And so, in this particular property, the tenant pays their electric bill, their gas bill, and cable TV and the owner pays for water, sewer, trash, and landscaping. This is the most common setup, but it can change. What could be the red flag? The red flag is zero vacancy allowance. Um, in the tenant pays, owner pays, like it'll be blank. In oh. them, like, so you don't know, yeah. you didn't ask, right? These numbers, which we'll go over next, go into your end of user expenses, and like uh, management expense, like Aaron was saying, if, if you self-manage, it's zero. Well, it might not be self-managed for the next person, so they should at least have some kind of, some baseline. Kind of baseline, right? Okay, because why? 
NOI. Okay, NOI is the most important number because then that's how you calculate like everything. So here's those same list of numbers. Your gross rent on this one isn't on this column, but it was like seventy thousand. And then when you take away your vacancy rate, that's how you get your adjusted gross income. That's sixty-six six nine zero. And then you these are all your operating expenses. This is gas, insurance, landscaping, maintenance, management, trash, and there's some other in here too that they're they're not as common, but these are your most common ones. And this is how you start to like analyze it. And what can cause red flags is like if trash was zero, why would trash be zero? Trash, you just said in the other screen that you pay for trash. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't there be an expense there? Think like things like that. So as you look through these, you should have expenses and some of them should be like more like common like the management expense should probably be about 10 percent of the gross rent costs right because most property managers charge about 10 percent i think in this one i used eight percent because it was managed by a company we used and if they just took that over that's they were going to honor that price so then if you go into calculating the noi so here's where i said before that gross income was 70,200. Now remember, this is Performa. So this property wasn't actually performing at 70,000 a year. I just told you it could. Mm -hmm. Okay? So then I took that vacancy rate, which was 5% of that gross rent, and then we, now we have our adjusted gross. The beauty of the MLS is it'll do that math for you. It won't calculate, I can't remember. It either doesn't calculate the cap rate or doesn't calculate the NOI, but it calculates one of them. Um, and then your operating expenses are all these added up, right, for the year. And then so you subtract that, and now you have your, your net operating income or your NOI. And then that's what you use to start to move things around. Your cap rate is your NOI divided by the property's current value, okay? I say value and not price because remember performa mm -hmm. net operating income divided by asking price it always comes in a decimal so now we convert to a percentage mm -hmm. so this one i sold i actually sold higher but this one i said this if you do what i tell you to do this can perform at a 6.44 cap i actually mm -hmm. sold this for 800 so then it came down uh, that's probably closer to a five. The way it was actually operating was probably at like a three. So because all these rents were like <coughs> six bucks each. Okay, I know I'm going really fast, so I want to stop and see if there's any questions. How did you get it to the higher cap? What did you do? Um, the rents or? Yes, you would say that the rents are more valuable. So in this instance, this was in Mesa. Most Mesa two bedrooms in this type of building are renting for like 1200 bucks a month and then there was a three bedroom unit that was vacant so that's why it's performa because there is no lease right so and that would rent i think he rented it out for 1650. yes sir i think that was a follow-up question oh okay so thank you already and just for you but you were asking for this um catheter um, I know I cannot do that at all, but it does do the cap. Thank you. I knew it was one. I can't remember which one. It calculates one, but not the other. NOI, it, it, there's a reason why we keep talking about it. It's because it's what everything else is based off of. But what it also means is that it's subjective. When people call you and they're like, I want something in a six cap, you're like, well, what does that even mean? Does that mean performing at a six cap? Does it mean it could perform at a six cap? Because once you mess, with all these numbers, I just changed the cap rate. What if I said the, the property manager only charged 5%, right? What if I said you could self-operate it? Now I just manipulated those numbers and I made my cap rate look more attractive. So when you're looking at something, especially in the MLS, where all these numbers are laid out, right? And you're like, okay, it says performa. Well, now let's look at it. So you call and you're like, you say your rents are $1,500 a month. Are they actually $1,500? No, no, that's just what they should be. Well, what are they? They're 500. 
So you mean I have to raise rents a thousand dollars to get there? That means you either have to evict everybody yeah. and clean up the units, right? Which we call value add, and then raise the rents or start to do rent increases. No matter what, you're not seeing that value for a year at, at, at least. least, right? So that's what that's the red flags you have to look at. You know, things like maintenance expenses. I just ran across one that said forty thousand dollars. Why? What did you spend on that? Well, it's because they had to do a lot of capex expenses, capital expenses, meaning like they had to do new ACs. Um, I think they there was something else they had to do, but it was. Right. It made it really, really high. So now that brought down your cap rate. Well, next year you might not have to spend that. So now we can kind of play with that number a little bit, right? Well, and some of those things too, Carla, I mean, it's a value add to the building. The right. Person, so that you realize that the next owner is not going to deal with some of right. those problems. So if you see a huge number on those, then, and you ask why, and they're like, oh, because it has four new brand new ACs. Well, that's actually a good thing, mm -hmm. even though it brought the even though it brought the cap rate down. Um, your trash expense, sewer expense, like I said, remember they said these are really common. If these say zero, we need to make sure why. It's pretty rare in Arizona that a landlord doesn't have to pay for water, sewer, trash, unless it's like a single family. Are you going to ask me a question? I was going to ask, how would I conservatively underwrite this deal? How would you conservatively underwrite this deal? <laughs> you would just go off my numbers and tell me how great I am. <laughs> Like I said, I sold it for more. Awesome. Of course you did. Of course I did. So I want to go over like some frequently asked questions I get. And I left a lot of time for questions because I realize this is a lot of information. And as we kind of go backwards, we can think about things. So when you call an agent from the MLS and you're like, $500,000 for this, what is that? And they're like, oh, well, per door, that's a great deal. What does per door mean? Per unit, right? per each one. Mm -hmm. So like in Mesa right now, we're selling at like 160 per door, right? So like even just rough ballpark in your head, I can look at a fourplex and go, well, that should be about that, just based on per door. Then I start to analyze their expenses and their rents and, and everything that goes along with it. Now, that would be a four unit, right? Because that's how they comp that. That's how they, that's how they sell that. That's how they do their, their financing is just like residential based on comps. Capital expenses, we talked about that. Those are like big ticket items. That's AC units, it's you know flooring, it's roofing. Yeah, roofing, it's um, paint, stuff like that. Stuff that's expensive for you to do, you're hoping somebody else already did it. Um, GRM, has anyone ever heard of GRM? Gross rent multiplier. So that's just price divided by gross rent. These are all different for different investors. Like Aaron was saying, kind of like, what are they looking for? I have one guy who's like, don't send me anything over a 12 GRM. That's just, that's the number he uses. Okay. Cash on cash, divide your net cash flow by your total cash invested. There's a lot of people that they have a very strict number in their head for their cash on cash, and they don't really care what anything else is. ROI is subtracting the initial value of the investment from the final value of the investment, right? So if I pay for it today and I put money in on it today and then I have to put more money in on it to then increase it, what can I sell it for to know what my, my return on investment is? We already kind of went over like, what's a good cap rate? Like big, fat question mark. What does performa mean? Performer means I made up numbers, and it's up to you to figure out if those are true. What is value add? Value is literally what it sounds like. It means adding value to the property. That can be done with rent increases. So they call that like an easy value add, right? I used to do a $100 rent increase, and now, now it's performing on that. Um, sometimes it means evicting everybody and cleaning it up. Sometimes it just means like uh, the one I was just talking about, that have the parking structure, some people will charge for that. Those are premium spots. Well, that's an area to add value to your rents. How easy is it to raise rents? In Arizona? Yes. As long as the lease is expired. 
if the lease is expired with it. Mm -hmm. So in, Air in the state of Arizona, if your tenant is in a lease, that price is locked in. If yeah. their lease ends on December 31st, mm -hmm. there's no rent control here and anybody can raise it to whatever they feel like. I would imagine it would take a while to evict someone if there's no cause other than wanting to. Yeah. So most landlords will just look at you and say, we're not renewing your lease. Or if we do, it's now double. What would you like to do? Mm -hmm. Most yeah. people they say, push you out, basically. I'm out. Like, I'm not going to deal with an eviction. There are a percentage of people that are like, make me. And then that's when the eviction process happens. That's like five years ago. Well, more longer, depending on what has to happen. That hurts them more than hurts the landlord. Right. The landlord just is what, out a month or two of rent? Okay. Does the lease change on a fourplex to now five and up? Meaning that if you have a lease in place and it's a fourplex, is it more on the residential lease terms? So you still have to give them 30 day notice. The lease is expiring December 31st. You still have to give them 30 day notice no matter what. If you don't say anything and you're going to January, February, you're still all the as a landlord to give them 30 days. Is that how it works on the Correct. family? Correct. Yes. Even, then, even at the yep, 20, even at the largest level, budget. because those are residential units. That is a Each person. One renting that apartment right now if they wrote it in that it's different yeah then, right so they should instead of just signing their apartment lease they should read it but most people just sign it yeah the biggest difference is on the on the purchase of your commercial property yes. the commercial it's, it's, it's because of the financing on why multifamily becomes commercial right. you would still manage a, uh, a residential rental like you would manage any other residential right. rental um, yeah. just obviously there's maybe more or less amenities that's why multifamily's gotten so popular right you have all these landlords that own five houses ten houses one house well i can use almost the same amount of, amount of money down or now sell that single family with how crazy the market is and put that into one unit. six units ten units twenty units one building, unit. one building yeah. right now i only have to finance one building and I have multiple leases, I have multiple checks. What that also does is what happens when you own a single family and your tenant moves out? That's it. Right. You're, you are responsible for everything. But when you have multiple doors to now kind of cover some of the rent, awesome. then right, it offsets your costs. So that's one of the reasons it's gotten so popular here. The other reason in Phoenix why it's gotten so popular is because we have been growing at like amazing rates. We're featured on, I don't know if you're familiar with Bigger Pockets or um, anything like that. They're always talking about the Arizona market, or at least they were like two years ago. Yeah. Now, not so much, but we still have 250 people moving here per day. Yeah. And they all have to live somewhere. And so that's why even on the residential side, you have the Zillows coming in overpaying for things because they're speculating that in two years this is still going to happen. So they're willing to take that risk. I can tell you from a commercial lending perspective, so that was my prior life, so when you're looking at this kind of stuff like Carla was saying, like if you have, if you're looking at a property to purchase on behalf of you know, your client and it already has people in it, a lot of times as lenders we would look to see like where their escalation clauses already built in for those leases so that you we didn't have to worry that somebody was going to try to evict everybody and have vacancy rates that they really didn't plan for or weren't being honest about recognizing could happen because they were going to evict people so if somebody was in there and they already had escalation clauses that you could easily could uphold then that helps because they were baking in their capital improvements and things like that right for those traditional commercial properties correct for a multifamily commercial property so for a residential lease you can mm -hmm. still write in a rent increase but it doesn't work in the same way as it does in the commercial space mm -hmm. where it's like automatic they have the option to be like and I'm, I'm done whatever the lease says with the notice that they need to get it still has to be there now I'm not a property manager this is not my favorite thing in the world but I have written residential leases for some of my favorite clients just to fill their property and they charge people. As you should. As I should. Yeah. All right, I know you guys have more questions. Um, how do you verify, you know, these are the poor plumber, so obviously they're going to disclose as much as they can, or like probably on the residential side, people are just really sloppy and lazy, mm -hmm. and don't put it down. 
Are you able to verify, what are you able to verify on your own, and then what do you need to yeah. get from them as documentation that will demonstrate and reflect what you're looking for? That's a really good question. So when you guys are writing a contract for duplex, triplex, fourplex, okay, make sure you are also looking for the RIPA. So that's the Residential Income Purchase Addendum. Okay? RIPA? Yep. R-I-P-A. And it'll say one to four units on it. Most people don't even know it lives <coughs> on AAR, but it does. What that does is it says part of my due diligence is I want to see your P&L, which is a profit and loss statement. I want to see your, um, I want to see your electrical bills. I want to see, I want to see all of that as part of my due diligence. To make sure what you showed me here Imagine. is actually accurate, or at least pretty dang close, right? And so that's part of that's just part of your due diligence. Most people, I will say, especially if you're calling on anything on the MLS, do not know the answers to those questions when you call them. And that's how you can set yourself apart. If you if you get your hands on a duplex to sell, it's just make sure you're doing everything up front because in my experience, eight times out of ten, those deals fall apart. Because now your investor doesn't trust not only doesn't trust them, may not trust you. Right? And like you're putting them in a bad deal and they want out. And they only have 10 days to decide that. Can you say the RIPA, uh, what it stands for? Residential Income Purchase Addendum. And use that if you, if you have a tenant occupied property too. And, and then there's single residential. Mm -hmm. And there's a RIPA SPUDS too. Mm -hmm. And so you should have both of those. Yes? Yeah? Then on the multifamily, how does the inspection period work where you have eight units, 20 units? Obviously on the front end, you probably can't get access to those units. Is there a specific way that on where the a contract is structured that allows you as the buyer to now view those actual units before purchase, all of them? Yes, as part of your DD, right? So in like your, in your five units and up, if you look at the commercial AAR contract, it automatically, kind of like the residential one builds in 10 days, it automatically builds in 30 days. Okay. Obviously for something like 200 units, you're gonna need more than 30 days because they cannot go into all those units on like one day. It's gonna take a significant amount of time. But in the MLS, you'll see all the time that you can't view the property, right? Yeah. Does anyone want to take a stab at why? Because they got some borders in there. <laughs> <laughs> because tenants tenants blow deals. I've been uh, like what and, and not they don't need to. They're like they're scared. They're afraid you're gonna kick them out. They're afraid you're gonna raise their rent. And that could be true, but it's not today, right? Yeah. They they're afraid that your new owner is gonna come in, they're gonna be one of these horror stories that they heard about, and they're gonna be like everybody out, and they're just gonna now what right now I'm gonna be homeless and they're freaking out and so they blow the sale and they'll do it on purpose. So if they don't know that it's for sale, sometimes that can feel kind of shady, but it's really not. It's to protect them. And because you don't want them freaking out in front of the buyer, right? Like now they will evict them. Like, wow, you kind of crazy. Like you're gonna go. Right? Like now they they want to know that this is a good property that has been well maintained, and that's it. Ninety-nine percent of investors want good tenants. So just show that you're a good tenant and nothing's gonna happen. So it's not an issue to write a contract without looking. No, I do it every day. It's just your job to explain to the buyers why. Why why does this happen? One of my very first triplex contract was in Tempe. And that sale fell apart. And it was a personal tenant. Mm -hmm. And like if I knew now then then kind of thing. Um, so I would have closed that easily. But at that time I didn't think it was a big deal and I walked away to do something and they had a side conversation. Uh -huh. Yeah. So anyway, that side conversation snowballed and turned into like into things that was a huge dispute between the buyer and seller that I couldn't get resolved. So <clears throat> is there a way to control that with the tenant and connecting to the I mean like how can you protect the interest there. A lot of times, a lot of investors, they don't want to walk through the units. They kind of don't care. They just want to see the inspection reports. You take good pictures. That's why the listing is actually really, really important. 
in CoStar, you don't see the same garbage you see on the MLS in terms of, you know, inaccurate numbers, you know, yeah. pictures. I shouldn't say <clears throat> never, but like it's less rare because they can't get in the movie, right? So they need they need pictures of the interiors, good pictures of the exterior, layout pictures, aerial, um, you know, anything that can give them a visual of what does this property look like. And then the inspectors will then take all the pictures, write down the good, bad, and ugly. And a lot of times they don't even care about going in. They may want to walk the grounds and kind of see one unit, and then they're done. The rest is like up to you. But in a smaller one, like a triplex, well, it's easy to walk through three units. So just make sure like the tenants kind of stay over there. Most of the time they want to be out, but sometimes they'll follow you around. And I think back to your question, you still draft the con you still draft the contract, but in the commercial fields you're gonna have a little bit more time in terms of due diligence like Harvard was saying. Correct. Like and, and again, on a three on a three flex, you know, thirty days is probably fine to do your due diligence. Your buyer can decide if they do or don't want to do it. You right. know, on it, it could be months on a two hundred. On a triplex in Arizona you can still write that as a residential yeah, contract. Can. Right, which has a built in ten day period. So the problem is, is on the other side of it, you're likely dealing with, you're dealing with one or two people. You're dealing with a residential agent or you're dealing with a commercial agent. Mm -hmm. Commercial agent's like 10 days, okay, that's fast. And they're laughing at you. Right, and a residential agent's like, wait, you want two weeks? What do you need two weeks for? Well, because I need to look at your numbers. What numbers? I, well, I'm going to need to see what like, PMLs and releases. Do you have copies? Well, I didn't think to get copies. And now, now I'm walking them through their own process because because they don't know the process. Right. Now, does that sound like we have our seller's best interest? Probably not. Are you posting both on the MLS and on CoStar? I do, because I have access to it. Yeah. But I would say I get all, like, my buyer leads all come from, like, CoStar and Coastal. So it's very rare that you actually sell it on the MLS. Any other questions? I was just going to reiterate also what Carla said. If you are if you have the listing, um, gathering all the due diligence documents so a buyer can confirm your numbers yes. is going to be huge. Right. If you have that on the day of, you should have it before the day of listing. Yes. Um, you, you're you're, you're going to get that call. And you're going to say, hey, what are the expenses? They're right. going to like, is it still available? And right. what are, can you send me the due diligence stuff? Yes, right. there they are. Yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't be a question. You know how like in residential, you're like, is this property still available? And you know, you always have to ask, these are the questions I have to ask on this side, is are your numbers actually accurate? Can I trust you to have done your job? Because our job is to do, for these types of properties, to do everything up front. So if you get a listing, you're not listing it that week, unless they're really organized, but I'll tell you most of them aren't. Even the organized ones are like, oh, I have to find that. And, oh, I have to scan it and yeah. send it over. Um, but getting all these numbers up front, this is that critical part so that they don't feel like that they have to go through all the units, so that they don't feel like they that they can't trust you or trust the seller because this was all accurate to begin with. And if this is all accurate, your, your sale is going to close a lot more times than it's not. You'll see a lot of these fall in and out of contract over and over and they wonder why. And it's like, because this is all wrong, and now that a buyer's looking at it going, well, wait a second, I do have to pay for water sewer trash? You didn't tell me that. That's, you know, 300 bucks out of my pocket every month. Like, that eats into my bottom line. I think the same thing's even applying on the residential side. Like, yes. nowadays, people are like, I want to see this buzz now mm -hmm. before I even want to go look at the property because I want to know what's going on when I'm walking into it. It's like that's it's controversial just, though too. It, it is, it's but it's like so funny how like so everybody because everything's yeah. like this these days is like, uh, I'll, oh well, if you want to give it to me, I'll move on and go past the next yeah. one. It's like well, you know, it's just, it's the same thing. Like be be prepared. Mm -hmm. Right. Then they brag about it, you know, and right. so you get this like, <laughs> right. 
Um, but we all have, we all agreed to the same code of ethics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We all have to be carried by our insurance. And I promise you, because I've seen lawsuits happen even over duplexes. Mm -hmm. So I sold a duplex um, in December. And he, we were going over the settlement statement. And he's like, why are they taking the deposits? I was like, because they don't belong to you. They belong to the tenants. Mm -hmm. Right. And he goes, but when I bought it, I didn't get the deposits. Mm -hmm. That sucks. Sorry. But he, if that was a bigger unit, right? Or an expensive one, like a Scottsdale one, where you're talking $2,000 per person for deposits, mm -hmm. he can sue you. But guess what? Your E&O is not going to cover you. So who's going to be responsible for it? You are. Because over deposits, because you didn't take a glance at the settlement statement, because you didn't even think to look for it. And that's like that's that's a real thing. I know of an agent recently who was getting sued because there wasn't laundry in there, and she said, "No, there there could be laundry in there. Remember that performa? Yeah. There could be laundry in there, and if you put laundry in there, then you could ask for these rents." And that buyer said, "No, no, you told me there was laundry in there." She's like, no, I told you there could be. And now it's just what, back and forth? Well, the difference in those rents in that area is $500 a month. So guess what, now they have a lawsuit. So I can protect yourself on that. Right, now fortunately she was operating within her, you know, in her area of expertise, so her e &O and coverage will take care of her and her broker hopefully, but if you're not, then that can be a big deal. Does that turn like a he said, she said, or how do you protect yourself? Shouldn't that be in the contract? Or? Yeah, that's what I mean, well, so they signed off on it, right? Like, like, what's, how does that work? Oh, well, now you're seeing the issue with the mail. Performa, right? Knowing the difference. Mm -hmm. Because the buyer bought on um, Performa, and the buyer thought they were buying on actuals. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, that agent also went to the Oh, that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So, mm -hmm. right. Yes. Yeah. So just, it's just a good good thing, guys. I mean, think about always following up your conversation with an email. Yeah, I mean, I put like out right your conversation. I, as soon as I hang up, I'm all like on email. Her earlier conversation today, blah, 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 blah. I started highlighting things, and I just, and yellow highlighter, I'll highlight. So if the word pro forma should be highlighted, highlight it, and I attach that in the email. Well, I think and I'll highlight specific like, things. What my homework would do is they would call you. And they would say, hey, there's a complaint against you. Did you contact MHG Commercial and have them be part of this in any way? And if you're like, well, no, then they're going to be like, oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Then you're not going to have your broker back. Or you're, you know. Like it's, especially with someone like an investor, they have in-house attorneys. They have, like, they're like, fine, send them, send them something. Oh, I'm mad. I paid this much for that because of this. Yeah. Especially the deadline is probably worth that's very hard on that one. Yeah. So does anyone have like any multifamily buyers that they like they're asking you questions and you're wondering how to answer those? Has anyone heard of house hacking? No, I'm gonna ask I wrote that down. Okay. So house hacking is you live in one unit and you rent out the other, right? Because four units and under is a residential purchase. Technically you can do that with an FHA loan or a VA loan. So you can, I put someone in a duplex last year and she house hacked. Mm -hmm. So she put 3.5% down, she moved into her side of the unit, she remodeled the other one, she's charging $1,300 a month for the other side, and her mortgage is 16. So she's paying $300 a month to live in a property that has probably already gained like $60,000 in equity. It's not that good, right? Now if you did that with three units or four units, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is if it's on performa, you still have to get everybody out. You have to do all the things. You have to increase rent. So that's only ideal in an operating multifamily. The problem is, is those are more expensive. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to get the call on it. And good luck getting the seller, just like residential, to take a FHA or VA loan. The luck I've had is going on the MLS. And instead of clicking the multi-dwellings button, click the residential button mm -hmm. and look for mislabeled uh, multi-family properties. Mm -hmm. Because even a duplex should be listed under multi-dwellings. It shouldn't be listed under residential, but I see them listed as Gemini properties all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then I'll call that agent. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what house hacking is. Mm -hmm. Some people do it, uh, they'll buy a single family, with like a casita or something, and they'll rent out the casita Airbnb, that's also considered house hacking, because it covers their mortgage. Okay. Thank you. If there's no other questions, I'll let you guys go. The day is done. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, very cool.